In the year 464 of Middle Earth's first age, two big things happened. First up, in the elvish woodland kingdom of Doriath, the mortal man Beren first laid eyes upon the immortal Luthien Tinuviel. And their meeting began the first of the great tales of the Elder Days. Beren and Luthien's story is one of hope, it's one of triumph, and it's one of goodness enduring and overcoming the evil of Morgoth. The second big thing that happened in that year was the birth of a baby far off in the Manish realm of Dorlomin. In the histories of Middle-earth, this child shall forever be remembered as Turin, son of Hurin, and his birth begins the second of the great Tales. Not a tale of triumph over evil, but of resistance, defiance of the dark, and the fight to refute fate. Maya Govan and Melanine, and welcome to the beginning of the tale of the children of Hurin. In today's video, I will introduce the main character, introduce the main conflict, and get the ball of this story rolling. So, without any further ado, let's begin by taking a look at that time when Turin, son of Hurin, first entered the world. The fact that he was born in the same year that Beren met Luthien does not feel to me like a coincidence. Turin and Beren can, in some ways, be thought of as kind of like two sides of the same coin. They are both among the greatest mannish heroes of the First Age, they are both among the most fervent enemies of the Dark Lord Morgoth, and although they walk very different paths in life, they are actually both related. In order to understand our hero Turin, we first need to understand his parents. Obviously, Hurin is a highly iconic figure in his own right, but I want to begin by talking about Turin's mother, a lady called Morwen Elethwen, or Morwen Elfsheen. I know the name of this story is The Children of Hurin, but that title does no justice whatsoever to the mother of those children. And in many ways, it certainly can be argued that Morwen has a much more direct impact on this story than her husband does. If you are familiar with the tale of Beren and Luthien, then you will know that Beren was the son of a guy called Barahir, and Barahir was the last chieftain of the House of Beor, the first of the three houses of the Edain, the mortal men, to enter Beleriand and become known as Elf Friends. But after the disastrous Battle of Sudden Flame, the Dagor Bragolak, the House of Beor was almost entirely wiped out. Except that Barahir's wife did lead a number of the women and children away from their homelands and into the neighbouring lands of Dorlomin, where they settled among the House of Hador and under the protection of Fingon, the High King of the Noldor. And among these women and children who came to Dorlomin as refugees, there was Barahir's great niece, the Lady Morwen Elethwen, the mother of the children of Hurin. And so, through his mother, Turin is actually Beren's first cousin twice removed. Turin is a descendant of the chieftains of the House of Beor, and so are both of his currently unborn sisters. Turin's father, Hurin, on the other hand, is not of the House of Beor, he is the grandson of a different Manish legend called Hador Lorindol, 
the dude for whom the mighty House of Hador takes its name. These guys were given the lands of Dorlomine by the High King Finigon himself before he was the High King, and of all the men in the First Age, these guys are the closest in friendship to the mighty Noldor. But the House of Hador does only represent half of Hurin's heritage, his father's side. Hurin's mother, so Turin's grandmother, was herself the great-great-niece of that epic warrior woman, Haleth, for whom the third house of the Edain, the woodland-dwelling house of Haleth, takes its name. This, of course, means that Turin and his currently unborn sisters are descended from all three houses of the Edain. They actually have a decent claim to potentially one day be chieftain of all three houses through three separate lines of descent. And the reason that I'm lingering on this is because elsewhere in the Legendarium, we will find a group of elvish siblings who, just like the children of Hurin, are distinctly descended from all three different clans of their people. Except in their case, it is the three clans of the High Elves, the Kalaquendi from the uttermost west. These elvish siblings have a mother who is a princess of the Teleri, a grandfather who is the High King of the Noldor, and a grandmother who is a princess of the Vanyar. These elven siblings are the children of the Golden House of Finarfin, and the most iconic one of them is Galadriel. I don't really know what to make of it, but I find it fascinating that in this particular regard, Turin and his sisters can be thought of as kinda the mannish equivalent of Galadriel and her brothers. They are all royal children from all three of the mightiest clans of their respective people. Anyway, when Hurin and Morwen had their first child in the same year that Beren and Luthien met, they named him Turin. And what Turin literally means in Sindarin is he who desires mastery. Not an unforeboding name. And just to add to the foreboding, in the Annals of Beleriand, we are told that Turin was born in the winter of that year with omens of sorrow. I guess it is worth pointing out that Turin was only born nine years after that disastrous Dagor Bragolak, the Battle of Sudden Flame, where Morgoth suddenly ended the centuries of peace in Beleriand. He devastated the Northland with fire and ruin, and he killed the great Elven King Fingolfin, along with his dear friend, that mortal legend Hador Lorindol. But three years after the birth of Turin, Hurin and Morwen had their second child, their first daughter. And her name was technically Urwen, but she is pretty much exclusively remembered by her nickname, Lalaith. And what Lalaith means is laughter. There aren't a huge number of happy moments in this story, but the days of Lalaith are an exception. Tolkien wrote that her hair was like the yellow lilies and her laughter was like the sound of the merry stream that came singing out of the hills. All the people of the household called the child Lalith, and their hearts were glad while she was among them. Interestingly though, Turin was a very different type of child. Lalith seems to take after her father, Hurin. They are both quick to laugh and they are both loved by all and they seem to wear their emotions on their sleeves, but Turin seems much more like his mother, Morwen, who Tolkien tells us was elven fair, but she was somewhat stern of mood and proud. Even as a young child, Turin promised to be like her, for he was not merry and he spoke little, 
Though he was slow to forget injustice or mockery, yet he was quick to pity, and the hurts or sadness of living things might move him to tears. At that time, all the warmth of his heart was for Lalith, his sister. But he played with her seldom and liked better to guard her unseen. Fair as an elf child was Lalith. I reckon the number one takeaway from this video should be that, in spite of Turin's future uh, complications, he was a delightfully sweet child. He was strangely stoic and reflective for a five-year-old, but he had such an immense capacity for pity and kindness and love. Remember that for future videos. Turin was the most wonderfully lovely child. Anyway, I will get back to him and Lalith in just a second, but Elsewhere in Beleriand during the childhood of Turin, Beren and Luthien were stealing a Silmaril from the Iron Crown of Morgoth himself. They were proving to everyone that the Dark Lord was not untouchable. Morgoth's power was of course immense, but not quite as immense as the power of love that existed between Beren and Luthien. By the end of their story, one thing is clear. If the will of the free peoples is strong enough, Morgoth can be overcome. I've talked about this way more in previous videos, but when Beren and Luthien proved to the people that hope did indeed endure, the great lords of the Noldor began preparing for the greatest battle yet. A battle to determine the fate of Beleriand and the future of the First Age. In the east, Myathros, eldest of the sons of Feanor, recruited dwarves and Easterlings to join his union against the Dark Lord, and in the west, High King Fingon made alliance with the men of Dorlomin to join him in battle when the time came. But this union of all of Morgoth's enemies took time to build, and in that time Morgoth became aware of their intentions. And so, from his underground iron fortress of Angband, Morgoth hatched a new evil. Not a dragon, or a balrog, or orcs, or anything like that. Instead, Morgoth sent out disease. A black pestilence, born from Angband on an ill wind that the men of the north came to call the Evil Breath. The elves were pretty much immune to such things, but among the men of Dorlomin, many sickened and eventually died. And this evil breath is another great example of why Morgoth is just the most despicably, detestably, horribly awful thing in the entire universe. Because for the most part, it was the children of the House of Hador who were struck down by it, the most innocent of all people. When Turin was only five years old, this evil breath of Morgoth came to his home. He fell sick, and for a long while he was gripped by fever and dark dreams, but it was not Turin's fate to die here and now. When the strength of life finally did return to him and he woke once more, the first person that he asked to see was his dear sister, Lalith. But when he asked his mother where she could be found, Morwen answered by saying, Laughter is stilled in this house. Whilst Turin was taken by fever, 
Lalith succumbed to the sickness, and she died. The first of the children of Hurin to have their life destroyed by Morgoth. I really hope this isn't an easy thing for you to do, but try and imagine what that must have been like for Turin. A five-year-old boy who loved his three-year-old sister more than anything else, learning that he lost her to the very same sickness that he had just survived. A young girl whose name meant laughter, taken from the world forever. And Lalith's death gives us a fascinating insight into the personalities of her parents. Morwen, her mother, meets this unimaginable grief in silence and with coldness of heart. Her only words to Turin are these, but you live, and so does the enemy that has done this to us. Hurin, on the other hand, was much more outwardly emotional in his grief. He took up his harp to write a song of lamentation for his three-year-old daughter, but in the end he couldn't do it. He smashed his own harp. He looked towards the direction of Morgoth in Angband, and he cried aloud, Mara of Middle-earth! Would that I might see you face to face and mar you as my lord Fenigolfin did. Which is, of course, a reference to that time where High King Fenigolfin gave his life to eternally cripple Morgoth with seven permanent wounds as an act of vengeance and justice for the death of his friend Hador Lorindol. Hurin's grandfather. Now, I really don't blame Hurin or Mordwen for this, I can't possibly know what they're going through, but another tragic consequence of Lalith's death is that poor Turin was now all on his own. He saw little of his father, and he never again spoke his sister's name to his mother. All he could do was weep bitterly at night alone. But within the household of Hurin, there was one man who really did show Turin kindness. And in time, he developed a really lovely friendship with the son of his master. This guy's name was Sador, but Turin gave him a different name, Labadal, which in Sindarin means Hopperfoot. You see, Sador was a woodsman of the house of Haleth, but due to an ill-fated axe-stroke in his youth, he'd accidentally hewed his own foot, and now he was an amputee. But Tolkien explicitly states that Turin's nickname for him, Labadal, Hopperfoot, was given out of love and pity, and there was absolutely no insult intended by it. In fact, in the time following the death of Lalith, Labadal became Turin's only real source of solace, and they developed a really heartwarming intergenerational friendship. Which brings us to another example of just how lovely Turin was as a child. At this point, he's only five years old, and he's the son of the Lord of Dorlomine. Labadal, on the other hand, is a disabled woodwright in the service of that lord, yet Turin keeps on coming back to him. While Labadal worked, Turin would fetch him what he lacked to spare his leg, and sometimes he would carry off secretly some tool or piece of timber if he thought his friend might use it. 
In his turn, Labadal rewarded as he could the kindness of the child, and he carved for him the figures of men and beasts. But Turin delighted most in Sador's tales. If I go through every single detail of the story, we will be here forever, but the conversations that Labadal and young Turin shared at this time are amazingly profound and philosophical. As Turin grew, he began to ask Labadal some pretty hard to answer questions about fate and mortality and the gift of men and the fear of the shadow of Morgoth that fell upon the very first men shortly after their awakening in the uttermost east. Turin says to his friend, My father is not afraid, and I will not be. Or at least, as my mother, I will be afraid and not show it. I shall go as a soldier with an elf king as soon as I am able. Three years later, three years after the death of Lalith, when Turin was nearly eight years old, the time finally came for that union of free peoples, the alliance of elves and men and dwarves, to take up arms and fight the ultimate battle for the fate of the First Age, the year of the Nirnaeth Arnoidiad, the year that cannot be forgotten. And right here, Tolkien gives us a deeply emotional private conversation between Hurin and his wife Morwen. As they discuss what this great battle might mean for their future, and what they might do if things go ill. And once again, we see a real difference in personality between the two of them. Hurin's heart is high with hope. He embodies the phrase elf friend in every sense of the words, and he simply doesn't believe that there is any power in Middle Earth that could ultimately overthrow the might and the splendor of the Noldor. He knows that one day soon his beloved High King Finnegon will call upon the men of Dorlomin, and Hurin will be the one to lead them into glorious battle and victory over the Dark Lord. But Morwen has less faith in the Noldor than her husband does, and she knows that their son is the heir to the House of Hador. If anything happens to Turin, there will be no future for the men of this land. She asks Hurin what she should do if the battle is lost and Dorlomin falls to the enemy. Hurin tells her, do not wait. Go south as swiftly as you can. If I live, I will follow, and I shall find you. But where in the south should she and Turin go? Well, there are three options that are considered. First, there is the Forest of Brethiel, where the woodsmen of the House of Haleth dwell in secret. These woodsmen of Brethiel, whom Tolkien called the Halethrim, are going to be a very important part of this story later down the line, and they are, of course, Hurin's mother's people, so they are family. But Morwen rejects this idea. Her people, the House of Beor, were wise and great, but they are now almost extinct. The House of Hador are even mightier in arms than the House of Beor, and so if they fall too, what hope is there? for a scattering of woodsmen belonging to the small and secretive House of Haleth. How can they survive after far mightier men have fallen? Instead, Morwen suggests the secret elvish city of Gondolin. There, at least, hope shall dwell for a while. And don't forget, Hurin and his brother Huor were raised in Gondolin when they themselves were children. They are the only mortals ever to have seen it, and the only reason they were ever allowed to leave it is because they swore an oath 
that they would never share what they knew of the secret city with anyone. However, although Hurin has never even uttered the word Gondolin to her, Morwen has intuited over the years that that is where he spent his youth. Hurin confirms that she is correct, but he tells her truthfully that he never actually learned where it was located. Remember, he went there on the back of an eagle with his eyes shut, and so even if he chose to break his oath, he could not tell her how to find it. And so, the third option that's suggested is Doriath, the guarded realm of the Sindarin High King Eluthingol, and his sort of demigod wife, Melian the Maya. Melian the Maya is of the same order as Sauron and the Balrogs, but she is wholly aligned against them. She probably is the most potent player that the good guys have in their arsenal, and yet her most iconic powers are almost entirely defensive. Her husband's kingdom of Doriath is encircled and protected by the Girdle of Melian which is a sort of magical barrier that makes people go crazy and then eventually die if they pass it without the permission of the king or queen. So Morwen tells Hurin that so long as Melian dwells in Doriath, it will be safe from the encroaching evil. That is where she and Turin should go if the worst should happen. And she makes an interesting point. As I already mentioned, Morwen is of the house of Beor. She is the first cousin once removed of Beren himself. And Beren famously married Luthien, the daughter of Thingol and Melian. Which means, by now, Beren is the son-in-law of the king and queen, and so Morwen has every reason to believe that, as a distant branch of that same family, she and Turin will be welcomed and protected within the woodland realm of Doriath. However, Hurin does not like this idea. I think it's fair to say that High King Eluthingol of the Sindar has not historically been the closest friend to the High Kings of the Noldor. They have a bit of a hostile relationship, and Thingol's distrust of the Noldor is not entirely irrational, but there is no great love there. In fact, in this coming battle for the fate of Beleriand, Thingol will send no aid whatsoever, and out of Doriath shall come only two individuals to fight alongside the Noldor. Those two individuals are absolutely awesome, I'll talk a lot about them in a few videos time, but from the perspective of Hurin, a guy who absolutely loves both Finnegan and his brother Turgon of the Noldor, Trusting his family's fate to the High King of the Sindar is far from ideal. However, this heavy conversation comes to a very sudden end when Hurin laughs. Things will not go ill, he says to Morwen, and he tells her that when Morgoth is overthrown, High King Finnegan will restore the glory of the houses of Beor and Hador, and he will make Turin a king among men. But it is worth noting that when Hurin looks upon his son, it is as a man might look at something dear that he must part from. Deep down, I think Hurin does know there is at least a chance things might go wrong. Anyway, in the month of Guayaron, which mostly corresponds to the month that we would call March, Turin had his eighth birthday, the last birthday that he would ever spend with his parents. And as a birthday gift, Hurin gave to Turin an elf 
forged dagger, along with some foreboding advice on how to use it. Hurin says to his son, Heir of the House of Hador, here is a gift for the day. But have a care. It is a bitter blade, and steel only serves those that can wield it. It will cut your hand as willingly as aught else. Many may fear your blade. Turin is then kissed by his father. He runs off to enjoy his birthday, and in his heart was a warmth like the warmth of the sun upon the cold earth. On this day, life was good. Turin ran straight to his best slash only friend and cried, Labadal, it's my birthday, the birthday of the heir of the house of Hador, and I have brought you a gift to mark the day. Interestingly, giving gifts to other people on your birthday will, in 6,000 years' time, be a common custom among hobbits. And I think this is just another really beautiful moment that demonstrates just how kind and delightful young Turin was. I mean, what other eight-year-old would be so excited to give away a gift on their own birthday. And the gift that Turin gave to Labadal was the elf-forged knife that his father had just given to him. Now, Labadal was troubled by this gift. He knew that it was given by the Lord of Dorlomin to his heir, and thus probably shouldn't be re-gifted to a workman. But within the culture of the House of Hador, men held it a grievous thing to refuse a free given gift. And so Labadal does eventually accept the knife, and he says, You come of a generous kin, Turin, son of Hurin. I have done nothing to equal your gift. But what I can do, I will. Anyway, it didn't take long for Hurin to notice that Turin did not wear his birthday blade, and he assumed that it was because his son had been frightened by the warning he'd given. You know, steel serves only those that can wield it, it will cut your hand as willingly as aught else. But when Turin tells him that that's not the case, he just gave the knife to his friend Labadal, or Sador the Woodwright, as he's known by everyone else, Morwen said, Do you then scorn your father's gift? To which Turin replied, no, but I love Sador, and I am sorry for him. And then Hurin said, All three gifts were your own to give, Turin. Love, pity, and the knife the least. And after this day, Turin noticed that Labadal was treated much more kindly and with much more respect by his fellow men of Dorlomin. Honestly, this isn't the most important plot point to dwell on, but things are going to take a really dark turn. So while we have the opportunity, I do want to focus on some positives. Turin is an incredibly compassionate child, and Hurin is an incredibly caring father. These people do not deserve the fates that they are doomed to live out. Anyway, talking of that dark turn, only two months after Turin's eighth birthday, on a bright morning in May, the time finally came for the men of Dorlomin to join with the Noldor and to ride out to war, to fight the greatest battle so far in the history of the race of men. Morwen bade her husband farewell without tears, and she said to him, I will guard what you leave in my keeping, both what is and what shall be. It's a few more chapters before we learn exactly what Morwen is referring to here, but I'll tell you guys now, in this moment, Morwen is pregnant with that other child of Hurin's, the one who will never meet their father. But when Hurin bids farewell to Morwen, he tells her, We ride now 
with greater hope than we have ever known before. Let us think that at this midwinter, the feast shall be merrier than in all our years yet, with a fearless spring to follow after. In other words, the war will be over by Christmas, and when it's won, everything's gonna be great. Knowing how this battle of unnumbered tears is destined to play out makes these words incredibly bitter to read. Hurin departs Dorlomine with hope in his heart and glory on his mind, but there is neither hope nor glory in his future. And for Turin, this is the last time he will ever see his beloved father. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this battle, I've already explained that in full, but there is one particular fun fact that I want to remind you of, and that is that out of Doriath, there came no army to fight in this battle, no reinforcements, no soldiers at all to aid our alliance of heroes, except for those two awesome individuals. One of them is called Mablung of the Heavy Hand, and he is an absolute legend, and the other is called Beleg Kuthalion, and he is an absolute legend. Both of these guys will be very important players later in this story, I cannot wait to talk about them, but hold that in your mind. Of Eluthingor Sindar elves, there are only two who fought in this battle, and they are both epic friends of men. However, although I have already made three videos breaking down this battle of unnumbered tears, the Nirnayath Arnoidiad, from the perspective of the warriors who fought in it, what I haven't yet done is talk about it from the other direction, from the perspective of those who didn't go out to fight the women, and the children, and the elderly who stayed behind, the non-combatants of Dorlomin. After this battle is over, the might of the Noldor is broken. High King Finagon is dead, and his lands have fallen entirely to the enemy. And to Dorlomin, no tidings of the battle ever came, the triumph of Morgoth is almost complete. Orcs roam freely through Beleriand, and each day they push further and further south, but it's not orcs that come to conquer Dorlomin. Instead, it is the men who betrayed the Alliance, the men that serve Morgoth. These incomers from the East are known primarily as the Easterlings, but it's definitely worth pointing out that these First Age Easterlings seem very different from those Third Age Easterlings that we meet in The Lord of the Rings. Those Easterlings come from the lands of Rune, but these Easterlings come from the lands just east of Beleriand, which means I'd say they're probably more closely related to the future men of Bree or the pre-Dunedain locals of Arnor than they are to the men of Rune. Anyway, for the elf friends left in Dorlomin, these Easterlings represent a fate worse than death. They came into the land in great numbers, and they dealt cruelly with the people of Hador, and robbed them of all they possessed, and enslaved them. All the people of Hurin's homelands that could work or serve any purpose, they took away, even young girls and boys, and the old they killed or drove out to starve. Dorlomine, under the dominion of the Easterlings, is a harrowing place. The leader of these Easterlings is a guy called Broder, and Broder took a kinswoman of Hurin's, a lady called Irene, and he forced her to be his wife. But interestingly, Morwen is pretty much left alone 
by the Easterlings. They simply did not dare to lay a hand on her, for the word ran among them that she was perilous and a witch who had dealings with the elves. And so, in secret, Morwen gathered as many of the elderly and the women and the children that she could muster, and she kept them close in the old homestead of her husband. Among the civilians was Labadal. But before long, the home of Hurin began to fall into decay. And though Morwen laboured hard to protect her people, they slowly began to starve. In fact, the only reason that they didn't all starve to death was because of that woman, Irene, a distant cousin of Hurin's, who secretly defied her new tyrant husband, Broder, and stealthily sent food and other provisions to Morwen and her people. But I guess one of the worst parts of this entirely awful situation is that no one knows what actually happened in the battle. They know that Hurin and his brother Huor rode out with thousands of warriors, they know that none have returned, and they know that the battle was lost. But is Hurin still alive? Are any of the men still alive? No one knows. Turin says to his mother that he thinks his father must be be dead, for no one could keep him from coming back to help us if he were alive. But to this Morwen says, I do not think that either of those things are true, my son. And so, throughout this summer and autumn of grief, Turin remained hidden away in his mother's care, flying under the radar of the Easterlings. But this was not a sustainable solution. Sooner or later, he would be found by the Easterlings, and then one of only two things could happen. Either Broder would learn the truth of Turin's identity and he would be killed, or Broder wouldn't learn the truth and Turin would be enslaved. Either way, from the perspective of the Lady of Dorlomine, this was no fit fate for the heir of the House of Hador. So, Morwen made preparations to send Turin away. She remembered her conversation with Hurin and decided that Doriath was where she would send her son. For in the care of King Eluthingol, and within the girdle of Melian, perhaps he might have a future. But Morwen is not going to go with him. She decides to stay in Dor Lomin. And I think there are four potential reasons for why she makes this choice. First, by now, she is heavily pregnant and the road to Doriath is made up of treacherous paths through wild country that she reckons are far too perilous for her and her unborn child. Second, she is keenly aware that secrecy is the key to Turin's survival, and the more that went, the less hope of escape. Third, though she does not admit it, even to herself, there is still a part of Morwen that has hope for her husband, Hurin. There is still a flicker of a belief that he is not dead and that he will find her, just as he promised. But I think the final reason why Morwen chose to stay in Dorlomin boils down to her pride. Throughout the story, there is a lot to be said about Turin's pride and his stubbornness and his weird reluctance to accept help from other people, but I definitely think this uh, not-so-wonderful character trait is very much inherited from his mother. Morwen's last words to Hurin were the promise that she would guard what he left in her keeping. 
and for the wife of the Lord of Dorlomin to abandon Dorlomin after its invasion by the enemy is to allow Morgoth to conquer her home unchallenged. Morwen's heart grows dark for her children, but she is not yet ready to surrender her country. And so, in the autumn that followed the Nirnaeth Arnoidiad, Morwen told her son that he must leave his home and make the long journey to Doriath with only two companions to guide him. Turin hopes that one of these companions will be Labadal, but Morwen tells him, No, for Sador is lame and it will be a hard road. And since you are my son, and the days are grim, I will not speak softly. You may die on that road. The year is getting late, but if you stay, you will come to a worse end. But did my father not say that I am the heir of Hador? Turin says. The heir should stay in Hador's house to defend it. The heir should stay, but he cannot, Morwen replies. But he may return. Now, take heart. Would you not rather be a king's guest than a thrall? I do not know, says Turin. I do not know what a thrall is. I am sending you away so that you need not learn it. After this conversation, Morwen and Turin speak no more. But when Turin goes to tearfully bid farewell to his dear Labadal, he asks, what is a thrall? And Labadal replies, a man who was a man but is treated as a beast, fed only to keep alive, kept alive only for toil, toiling only for fear of pain and death. When Turin hears this, he understands his mother a little bit better. Morwen is absolutely not a warm, kindly, nurturing maternal presence, but this is not a warm, kindly story. Her cold, brutal pragmatism may not be what Turin wants in this time of hardship and sorrow, but I think it is what he needs. I think it can be argued that Morwen's perceived heartlessness is what saves Turin's life. Anyway, Turin and Labadal have the loveliest goodbye. Labadal offers to give back the elvish knife, but Turin refuses, saying it was a gift. And when he weeps for all that is to come, Labadal comforts him one more time. Hey now, he says, where is Hurin's son? For I heard him say not long ago, I shall go as a soldier with an elf king as soon as I am able. Then Turin wipes away his tears and he makes ready for his journey. With only two companions to guide him, he departs Dorlomin in utter secrecy. And as he looks back at his mother's house, the anguish of parting smote him like a sword, but he went on anyway. An eight-year-old child heading off into the wild. And as Morwen watched her son disappear from her sight, she clutched the post of her door until her fingers were torn. Now, I will, of course, return to Turin next week, but just before I finish this video, a few moments ago I said that after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, the triumph of Morgoth was almost complete. But not quite. As you'll know from previous videos, there was only one warrior of Dorlomin to survive this disastrous battle. And he was Hurin. 
I've already talked quite a bit about Morgoth's words with Hurin after this battle, and how it ended in Morgoth cursing Hurin and his wife and his children, so I won't go through that whole part of the story right now, but it's going to be a long time before we see Hurin again. And so I think it is important to know exactly what he's going through whilst his wife and his children are doing their own thing. You see, after the end of the Nir Nyath Arnoidiad, Morgoth kind of got what he wanted, but not all of it. 10,000 Knights of Gondolin rode out to do war with Morgoth in this battle, and when it was over, they disappeared without a trace. Gondolin remains the greatest threat to Morgoth's ultimate victory, and he knows it. Unfortunately though, he also knows that Hurin has been to Gondolin. He spent years there in his youth, and though he does not know its exact location, he knows enough that Morgoth would do anything to get him to talk. Therefore, the Dark Lord had Hurin chained and tortured, but before long he visited Hurin in person and offered him a choice. Either Morgoth would release Hurin to go freely wherever he pleased, or he would reward Hurin with power and wealth and rank, and he would make Hurin the mightiest of all his captains. All Hurin had to do to earn it was reveal the general area where Gondolin may be found. But Hurin defied the Dark Lord. He looked him in the eye and mocked him. So, Morgoth did to Hurin what is potentially the cruelest thing he ever did to anyone. He brought Hurin to the great hill of the slain, and he forced him to look westward towards Dor Lomin, where his family lived beneath the boot heels of the Easterlings. And then Morgoth stretched out his arm, and he cursed Hurin and Morwen and their children, saying, Behold, the shadow of my thought shall lie upon them wherever they go, and my hate shall pursue them to the ends of the world. I am the Elder King, Melkor, first and mightiest of all the Valar, who was before the world and made it. The shadow of my purpose lies upon Arda, and all that is in it bend slowly and surely to my will. But still, Hurin defied Morgoth. Still, Hurin mocked the god that killed his three-year-old daughter. Do you forget to whom you speak, he said. Such things you spoke long ago to our fathers, but we escaped from your shadow. Before Arda you were, but others also. And you did not make it. Neither are you the most mighty, for you have spent your strength upon yourself and wasted it in your own emptiness. No more are you now than an escaped thrall of the Valar, and their chain still awaits you. You are not the Lord of Men and shall not be. You lie. But to this Morgoth replies, with but a single sentence. You shall see, and you shall confess, that I do not lie. Then Morgoth took Hurin to the tallest peak of Thangorodrim, 
and he set him upon a stone chair from which he could see all the lands of Beleriand to the west and south. And Morgoth used his evil power to bind Hurin to that chair, so that he could not move from that place nor die until Morgoth shall release him. Then Morgoth cursed him again. He forced Hurin to look out at the lands where evil would now befall all those that he loved, and as punishment for daring to mock the self-proclaimed master of the fates of Arda, Morgoth declared that with my eyes you shall see, and with my ears you shall hear, and nothing shall be hidden from you. That is the fate of Hurin. To be bound to this high place, unable to move and unable to die, forever watching the suffering of his loved ones, forever knowing their pain and their hardship and forever seeing it through the eyes of Morgoth, through the darkest, ugliest, most twisted and hateful perspective imaginable, yet utterly powerless to do anything to help them. So, remember that. Throughout all the rest of this story, throughout all the trials and tribulations of Turin and Morwen and her as yet unborn third child, Hurin is forced to watch and to know that this is the consequence of mocking Morgoth. So, that is where I'm going to end this video, but in the next one I will continue the story of Turin and explain his time with the elves in Doriath, his years under the care of the High King Eluthingol, and the disastrous decision that will set him on the path towards his doom. But until then, Thank you all very much for making it to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, be sure to click like and leave a comment and hit subscribe if you haven't already to make sure you don't miss the rest of the story. But until next time, as always, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy and Navayar Melanine.